All right, we want to greet everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are grateful for everyone that's here today. All right, if you have your Bibles, let's go to the second chapter of the book of Genesis. And second chapter of the book of Genesis. All right, where is Sister Jayla at? Here. All right, the Lord instructed me to pray for you this morning. Give me your hand. Everybody bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come lifting up our dear sister to you, Lord. We pray that you will keep her in the way. God, we pray that you will help her mind to be renewed as she continues to grow in you. Help her, Lord, to accept your perfect will for her life, Lord. And God, we ask that every trap that the enemy have set up for her, we ask that you will give her spiritual eyes so that she can see those things, Lord. Help her, Lord, to continue in the way that you've called her to be. And God, I pray that you will help her to keep her heart pure and help her to be pleasing to you, Heavenly Father. And don't let her be tainted by the things of the world. But we ask, Lord, that you will keep her, keep her mind, keep her heart, Lord, so that she can remain a vessel for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. All right, Brother Tillman, let me pray for you. All right. Yeah, that's fine. So your, your spine is scoliosis. And you ask for prayer that the Lord will fix it for you. All right, let's pray. Everybody bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we bring Brother Tillman to you. God, he has scoliosis. But right now we rebuke it. And we command his spine to straighten up and to line up with your perfect will. So right now, Lord, we thank you for his healing. Lord, we thank you for the evidence of this healing. And we pray, Lord, that you will protect not only his spine but the rest of his body, Lord. And we know that there's an enemy that's coming against this. And so right now, God, we lift him up to you and we ask that you will hear our prayer. Correct his spine, Lord, so that he can be upright, not only naturally, but spiritually as well. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. God bless you, brother. All right. Uh, someone in someone, I don't know if it's someone here or not. I had a vision about it. That someone has, a, uh, but I didn't see who it was. I don't know if it's somebody here, but somebody is feeling the effects of a car wreck that they had, that they were in. Is anyone here still feeling it, any effects of a car wreck that you may have been in? I don't know how long ago this was, uh, but somebody's feeling the, car, the effect of a car wreck that they've that they have had. Is it anyone here? Anyone here feeling the effect of a car wreck that they've been in? All right, what do you, you want to share what it may be? Okay. All right, let's pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your word of prophecy. And God, we ask that you will heal his neck, Lord. We know that the enemy have come to try to come against his body. And so right now, Lord, we pray that you will heal his neck and any other area that may be affecting him, Lord. We thank you for his life, Lord. And we pray also that you will guard his life. As we know, the enemy have sent assaults against his life on several occasions. And we ask, Lord, that you will continue to protect him. We thank you, Lord, for this healing. And, Lord, we thank you for this testimony. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. All right. All 
All right, is everybody there? The second chapter of the book of Genesis. And we're going to start reading at verse 15. Look what it says there. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt do what? Thou shalt do what now? Now I think that's very interesting. It's very interesting. You know, God, (laughs) I want us to think about this. How did God create the world? With what now? With what? His words, right? With his words, God created the world. And uh, he didn't, and let's pay attention to that now. God is not like mankind where he feels the need to go above and beyond. Y'all understand now? Um, When you're doing things by faith, it doesn't take you um, being overly exerted in those things. Um, you You just speak and you believe that your words are carrying weight. And so when the Lord created the the world um, he just said let there be light and there was light everybody see now we wanted to start there to uh, uh, really paint this picture for you Uh, and I hope that you get it that God never had to beg anybody for his will to be done uh the elements he didn't have to say please please if you if you really believe I'm God then let there be light it was he understood who he was and so he just said let there be light and there was light isn't that right now and so now he's created man and so God don't have to say uh, let there be something please pretty please Please, with sugar on top, let there be. Don't make me look like a fool. Just please, just let there be. He didn't have to do that. But look at what he has to do to convince man. Look at the extra word there in verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt what? What's the extra word there? Surely. As sure as I'm telling you this, this is what's going to happen if you do this. So isn't it something that that when God is speaking to nature, nature obeys. Whatever he's speaking to, it obeys. But with mankind, it has to be surely and barely, barely. (laughs) Isn't that something now? That's because he knows and have known from the beginning of time what mankind would struggle with. We would struggle with whether or not God really means what he says. You know, uh, let's go real briefly. Let's go to the third chapter of the book of Genesis. We're going to start reading at verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, and I want to make this clear, and I I hope this will help some of us today, that when the only thing the devil has in his arsenal to go against, uh, to, to bring down mankind, is unbelief of God's word. That's that's all he has. That's, that's the only thing that the devil has in his arsenal is doubt and unbelief. That's all he has. Everything that the devil does 
is always pinned against God's word, always. Other than that, he wouldn't be a devil. Does everybody understand what I mean when I say that now? There would be no such thing as a devil if there was no such thing as a God with his word. There, there would be no such thing as evil if there was no such thing as good. It would just, things would just be. And so when we talk about the devil as an adversary, what is he adverse to? God's word. And when we're talking about God's word, we're not just talking about this word. We're talking about whatever his will is, really his will. We'll put it that way. God's will. And so in the second chapter of the book of Genesis, we read what God's will was. He told them, you know, to do different things. But he said, that, now this tree, now I've given you every, every tree that's in the garden, but this one, don't you eat it. Because the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely what? Now, I always thought that it was very interesting that the Lord called that tree the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that seems to be the very thing that have caused mankind to fall, even to this day. It seems like the smarter we get and the higher we go up in education, the, the more harder it becomes for us to believe that God exists. Atheists oftentimes sit at the top of the education system. It's, it's very odd to see. It just seems like the more educated we become as men and women, the harder it is for God to really get in there and penetrate uh, what he needs to penetrate. That's the reason why some of us as believers, when we go to the doctor and uh, they of course, they only know to go by what they read in the books and things like that. And if you come in there with faith, they got something to say about it. You could say, well, you know, I just believe God. I'm going to be healed. I believe. You. Well, what are you talking about? And, you know, it ain't hardly a doctor in this world that haven't seen a miracle. There's hardly one that haven't seen that where God have defied their reasoning and their logic and what they've seen in their books. It ain't hardly a doctor that can't tell you that they haven't heard a story of them declaring somebody brain dead or them declaring somebody dead and covering them up with a sheet. And then the next thing you know, a few minutes later, they come in there and, the, and the, the sheet is going up and down. The person is breathing again. But they never stop to think. All they got, to, what they're going off of is most of their evidence. 99% of the people that we cover with a sheet and we declare dead, they stay dead. So we don't, we, the, the 1% is an anomaly. They'll call it that, they call it everything but God. And so knowledge <clears throat> from the beginning of time have always gotten men into trouble. Now, what does that look like today? Today we have small children in this room, isn't that right? And for the most part, all they know is God's truth and deliverance and, and God's word and how to live according to God's word. Isn't that right now? But they, they go to the store. When they get older, they're going to see things. They're going to see other children. You know, here, we try not to give little five-year-olds cell phones. <laughs> But they'll go to the store, and they'll see other little children with liberties that maybe they're not used to. And curiosity will get the best of them. And all of a sudden, they'll start wanting, they'll, they'll start wanting what they think the world has to offer. They'll think that there's freedom. There's freedom out there. It's, I'm missing out. And, and that's, that is your, the, today's uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I wonder what that feels like. I wonder what it's like to have a boyfriend at 13, 14, 15. Even though I'm not thinking about marriage, even though I ain't, I'm not ready to be anybody's wife or I'm not ready to be anybody's husband, whatever. The, I wonder what it's like. Well, you don't need to wonder. You understand now? And I just have to tell it like it is. Sisters, you don't need to wonder what it's like to have a husband, what it's like to have a boyfriend, until you learn how to cook. 
don't touch that tree until you don't learn how to cook for that tree. <laughs> you husbands, don't wonder what it's like to have a girlfriend or are you men, don't wonder what it's like to have a girlfriend or a wife until you learn how to provide. Uh, until nobody have to tell you to take the trash out. If somebody still got to nudge you to do just everyday things, you're not ready for any more responsibility. So, but, so this is the knowledge of the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Does everybody understand? Those things that, that God have kept us from, oftentimes young people will grow up and they, they want that knowledge. They want, the, in other words, the experience is what that tree represented. The experience, what is the experience like? And you can tell them, you know, that if you eat of that tree, it's going to kill you. It's going to take that, that innocence that you have, it's going to take it. It's going to turn you into a bitter somebody. Well, you know, maybe that, and they'll think, well, that happened to you, but it won't happen to me. That's what they think. Yeah, that's your, that's your testimony, but that's not going to be mine. And I'm telling you, people get burnt all the time. You cannot eat of that tree without there being consequences to it. Y'all understand that now? I, my wife is sitting back there. The Lord told her not to marry somebody, and she married him anyway, and she got burned. My daughter the same way. Her daughter sitting here now. The Lord told her not to marry somebody, and she married him and got burned, buried who she married. Got pregnant, lost the baby, was bitter against the Lord behind it. Well, the Lord never intended for you. You, you wouldn't have had to worry about any of that if you had obeyed the voice of God. And all of mankind today are mad at God behind consequences that he told us about from the beginning. He told us about the consequences of our actions from the beginning, and we're still mad at him about it. We still get mad, still get bitter. Y'all understand it now. And you know, God uh, God will even help us out in it, if, especially if he said we just, we're just determined to, to do it. Y'all understand? Somebody tell me, what was the, where was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? In the middle of the garden. Not on the other side of the world. <laughs> if you want it, you're going to have to walk 24,000 miles to get it. He put it right there in the middle. Let me save you time since you got it in you to do it. Let me put it right there in front of you. Y'all understand that now. When I first, uh, when my mother first gave me my daddy's, his guns. Um, I went to Louisiana and got them, brought them back to Oklahoma. And my two boys, they saw me unpacking those guns and putting them up. And I saw their curiosity. <coughs> and I told them, I said, uh, y'all come here. Come here. And they came in. They, they couldn't have been, neither one of them were more than uh, five years old. And I said, here, this is your grandfather's gun. And I took both of them, they both still have in their holster. And I took them out and I put it in their hand. I said, this is what it feels like. It's cold, it's metal and things like that. And I explained, you know, um, how it operate. And they said, okay, okay, thank you, Daddy. And that was the end of that. I never had to worry about them uh, with guns anymore. I took the curiosity away from them. I did not want to come home one day and find them playing with it and waving it all over the place. We're just going to get that all out and open now. This is what it is. I ain't trying to hide it from you. This ain't, it ain't against the law to have one. But this is what it is. This is what it feels like and things like, you know. I, so I got that out of them. And oftentimes, parents make the mistake of trying to hide the tree instead of telling them the tree is right there in the middle of you, right there in your midst. And this is the consequences of the tree. Does everybody understand that now? So let's go ahead and keep reading. Let's keep reading there. (coughs) 
Let's read verse 1 again. <clears throat> it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Everybody see that? Now, I want you to know. Now, the first thing that this verse tells us is that the serpent was more what? He was more what? Now, notice the subtlety of it. Look at what he says. Hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice he didn't come right out and name the tree. Do y'all see that now? Notice he didn't come right out and name the tree. He knows exactly what tree he's talking about. But he didn't come right out and just name the tree. He just said, did God say that you should not eat of every tree? And this one looks, this, that one, this, it's just trees. <laughs> Everybody see that now? And so what he's doing is he's appealing to this thing that's in mankind, well, you know, concerning back doors. Because, see, it's something in our nature that love back doors. Y'all understand now? It's the smart aleck in us that love those back doors. And I just use this as an example. You can say, uh, uh, Junior, get up. I want you to wash the dishes. And Junior, get up and wash the dishes and leave the pots and pans on the stove. But Junior, get up and wash the pots and pans. Junior, get up and wash the pots and pans, but spoons and forks still everywhere. Y'all see the back door? That individual that's just going to do just enough, that, that rebellion, that sneaky rebellion that we all have had in us at one time or another. And so this is, this is what the devil is appealing to. This back door that we have. Y'all understand that now? Look what he says, verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, What? Everybody see that? Now, you see how he's going directly against what God said. God said what? You shall surely die. The serpent says, ye shall not surely die. What is the lesson here? You know, um, I uh, love history. I love history. I got a cousin of mine who they call Hawk as well because he looked like my daddy and uh, in fact he's my daddy's grand nephew and uh, he and I we do a lot of family research and we share pictures and things like that and he just sent just last night he just sent me a picture of my grandfather uh, in 19 what was that 42 1942 if I'm not mistaken let's see no, 1945. It was 1945, I think it was. And uh, my granddaddy, at the, as a deacon at the church in Picayune, Mississippi, where, you know, he was baptized and his, uh, all of his children were baptized as children as well. And so I, I love um, family history. And when you're doing research for family history, of course, you also have to get to know graveyards. And you have to... Uh, figure out where people are buried and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, hopefully they have a marker and you can kind of get the gist of who's kin to who. Even graveyards uh, give you a lot of uh, information as well, if that makes any sense, uh, especially with family plots and things like that. And so, um, I, of course, the graveyard that we own across the street, I never thought to actually look it up and uh, look at the names and, you know, on this what they call find a grave. You know, they, every graveyard has its own uh, uh, account, I guess you could say, where people have, have um, kept records. 
And then sometimes they even upload pictures. And so, of course, when we bought this, when we bought this property and the property across the street, of course, the property across the street came with it. Uh, there was a lot of history with this, with this church and uh, the people. You know, the people, they come from a place called Enon, uh, North Carolina. And uh, there was two families that moved here, two big families that moved here. And uh, I don't know why they were moving, but they moved here and they wanted to start a church because they were church people. And in fact, the church, the church that they belonged to was Enon Baptist Church uh, because it was in the city of Enon. It was called Enon Baptist Church in North Carolina. In fact, the church stand today and it's almost a direct replica of this building here. And so uh, so the people moved here and they started the church. Of course, you know, the. That, you know, the first building that they built in 1880, it's around the corner, still in the people's backyard there. They moved it from this facility because um, apparently it was, the insurance was going to be too, was going to be higher than they were willing to pay to have that building standing there. That's the reason why they, they moved it. And so I was uh, looking up some of the, the information. Of course, we were given some of the history of this church and, uh, uh, when we bought this place. And then, I, of course, I looked, you know, uh, did the research for the graveyard over there. Uh, I think I was doing that this weekend. And uh, I saw several stories. And, I, you, know, you know, it's always amazing to me to read the stories of people and uh, to see, you know, and I don't know you, if you all think about that. And it's something for you to think about. Every time you pass a graveyard, you have to think this, that at one time the people in that grave was your age. They were alive. Some of those people were sitting right here where you're sitting. Some of those people buried across there were sitting in the very seats that you're sitting in right now. And I know that it's something that we don't like to think about because we think we got another 50 years. <laughs> but maybe some of those people didn't like thinking about it either. But it did not mean they weren't going there. They're there. Y'all understand now? We, we cannot think about it all we want. <laughs> and oftentimes people that have problems thinking about it is because they're not ready to meet God. And they know it. So when we, when we think about those things, God said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely what? You shall surely what now? So let's think about that. Was it meant for us to die to begin with? And so let's think about this. So death was a consequence of our disobedience. Death was. Something that was not supposed to happen, happened. Now I want you to think about that. That's a big one, isn't it? Think about over the years. What is it now? Eight billion people in the world? And if the Lord tarry the next hundred years, they're going to all be gone and just recycled. We're just going to keep reproducing. So just think now, if it's eight billion people in the world today, think about for the last 6,000 years or so, how many people have died behind one act, behind one act of one or two individuals. That number is almost innumerable to think about how many people are in the ground today behind one act. Y'all understand it now? One act. Now, my prayer is that we will understand that. What is the devil's, the, the devil's mantra? What is, what is his phrase today? Do what thou wilt. Isn't that right? What, what does that mean? Do what you want to do. What, what's the other side of it? What is, what is he saying when he says that? Do what you want to do. Why is he saying that? There are no consequences. There are no consequences. Even today, the devil is preaching the exact same thing that he preached in the Garden of Eden. There are no consequences. There are no consequences. Do whatever you want to do. And, you know, we can say, well, I ain't no devil worshiper. And I ain't never worshiped the devil. I ain't never had nothing. But if you were doing what you wanted to do, <laughs> the 
the devil don't care if you go to his church or not. You still live in his Bible. Do what you want to do. There are no consequences. And the world today is full of bitter people who did what they wanted to do and suffered the consequences. Bitter because they don't believe God's word. They don't believe that there are consequences. Why is it that we have a whole generation today that don't like consequences, that don't, that get bitter when they do something and then they have to pay for it? Because they're not being taught that at home. That's why. Children today aren't being taught that there are consequences. One of the best things you can do for your children is the exact same thing God did for his in that first generation. Tell them that there are consequences. And if they don't believe it, make them believers. You think God wanted death to come into this world? Absolutely not. But he had already spoken. The day that you eat thereof, you're going to surely die. God could have chose any form of something else that he wanted if he wanted to. But he chose death. He didn't say, if you, you know, if you eat of that tree, you're going to grow another head. No, you're going to die. I'm going to make it as ugly as possible. I'm going to bring something in this earth that you have never experienced before. Something that was not meant to be. And, and I, I, I want us to think about that. And, I, I, and I, I mean that this is personal for all of us in here today, not all of us that are watching and are, are watching or listening. I really want us to think about that. What is it in your life that you have brought about or that you will brought, bring about that was never meant to exist in your life? You wouldn't have never known that thing if you hadn't disobeyed. One for all of us, of course, we can name it, is death. We were never supposed to know what death felt like, never supposed to know that death even existed, that it was possible to die. We weren't supposed to know anything about that. But today we just kind of go along, you know, we just kind of go along with it because this, you know, as far as we know, that's just the way it's always been. But you think about your own personal life. What is it now? that you have experienced or that you are going down the road to experience behind something that you've done that was contrary to God's will. Years ago, I had a vision that I was walking down the street and uh, I was walking down the very middle of this street and on each side of that street, as I'm walking down, it had big dogs but they looked like lions they had big necks and big heads they, they weren't anything just naturally that you would see in this world but the best way I can describe them they looked like big dogs and I knew that they were demonic dogs they were just as tall as I was and I'm walking down this street and as I'm walking down this street they they were all on sides of the street on each side of the street and as I'm walking down the street they would come charging to the middle of the street where I was and they'd get right just about to where I was and a chain would, the chain would go its full length and they'd stop. And, uh, you know, after experiencing this, you know, that's just, if you can imagine a, a dog uh, being 20, 30 feet far, uh, 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 away from you, then you walk and then just in a split second, they just running up on you like that. You know, that was bothering me. And I, I knew that the chain that they had was a length that God had set for them. It was for two purposes. One, to keep them from overstepping their bounds, and two, to keep me in mind. God was telling me, the only way that these things don't attack you is if you walk the straight and narrow. The straight and narrow. So now, let's think about that. If you can picture that in your mind, what if I just decide to step to the left a little bit? What if I just decide, what well, I'm going to disobey. I'm going to step to the left just a little bit. I can only imagine what each one of those things represented. Some of them probably represented uh, some kind of sickness, some kind of disease. You, you know, them dogs that, like that, they carry all kind of things with them. So it makes you wonder now, what is it that we are deciding not to walk the straight and narrow about? 
There are always consequences, brothers and sisters, for our actions. Everything that we do, there are consequences for it. Everybody understand it now. Uh, good consequences and bad consequences. Uh, the good consequences is being in God's will. And that it, good things happen when we're in God's will. Bad consequences is when we decide to step away from it for a little bit, whatever that may be. Whatever that might look like in our life. Y'all understand it now. And I, I tell you, and we, we wanted to start there in the, in the Garden of Eden to show you that the consequences, they don't expire when you expire. It wasn't just Adam and Eve that died. Where, where, was, where was Cain and Abel and the rest of their children and the rest of us when God told Adam that? In the day that you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. It wasn't, wasn't he talking to Adam and Eve? I wasn't there. Y'all understand it now. The people across the street wasn't there. But because we were in their loins somewhere. Y'all understand it now. And that's something for us to think about. Our, our children, our children's children have to pay for our disobedience. And I guess the way I see it is we, we got enough devils we have to deal with and enough generational curses and all that other stuff we have to deal with. We don't have, we, we don't have time to be introducing new stuff. The devil's got 6,000 years on us. We, we don't have to come up with nothing new about it. Y'all understand that now. If we were cursed with death from the first generation, from 6,000 years ago, why are we still adding stuff? You would think everybody since then would get saved and stay saved. But now we got to come up with new stuff. We still eating off that tree. Still eating off that tree. Still playing along with the devil. He asking us, did, yeah, did God say you shall not eat of every tree? And we don't say, boo, devil, get away from me. What we start doing, okay, so the cherry tree, the plum tree, the apple tree, we're going to go down a whole list. Now, how do you know if the Lord is talking to you today? If you that individual that want to see how just how much you can get away with and still go to heaven. That's what the devil was appealing to. That thing that was on the inside of Eve that wanted to see just how much she could play with God before God just bring down a hammer on top of her. Y'all understand it now. The individual that like playing with sin. I know God said this, but he didn't say that. And, you, and you're exactly who the devil has gone in for. Does everybody understand now? So you see, they both found out, they both found out uh, that God meant what he said. Everybody understand? Let's go real briefly to the 13th chapter of the book of 1 Chronicles. The 13th chapter of the book of 1 Chronicles. And we're going to start reading at verse 1. All of God's word could be summed up in this. There are consequences for being outside of God's will. There are consequences. And oftentimes when we think about being outside of God's will, we're thinking about big things. We're thinking about, yeah, okay, Lord, so yeah, I, I ain't going to never shake my fist at you. 
I ain't going to ever do this. I ain't going to ever. And we and we forget it, it could be anything. It, it can be anything. Does everybody understand that now? Now, you know, uh, you know, most of you know, years ago, the Lord told me to stop eating popcorn. I stopped eating it. You know, later on, you find out, you know, what it's doing to people. Y'all understand it now? I said, y'all understand? I didn't ask the Lord why. I, I like popcorn. That was my go-to when I didn't feel like cooking a meal or, or whatever the case was. We can just get full on popcorn. That's good movie food. And but do you know, uh, and I'm going to just give it to you, and I listen, I know folks on YouTube, they're going to think a certain way. I, I don't care. But do you know popcorn is against nature? How does popcorn start off? As corn, right? As a seed. And that's the way God intended for it to stay. What, hap- what, what makes the pop, what, what happens to the popcorn? What makes it, a, what makes it pop? What is it doing? It's turning, it's exploding and turning itself inside out, isn't it? Exactly against God's nature. Popcorn is a perversion of what God created. Y'all understand that now? <laughs> Y'all understand? Do you know God intended for there to be metal in this world? But he didn't intend for people to take that metal and put heat to it and grind it down and make a sword out of it and kill people with it. Y'all understand? Yeah, so I hope you I hope you get it now. <laughs> It's against nature. Everybody understand it now. And so, you know, you you say, well, okay, so I remember when the Lord spoke that to me. All I had was buttered popcorn. Uh, he didn't say nothing about caramel. He didn't say nothing about popcorn balls. This is the way the sinner lives. The back door. Yeah, did God say you should not eat of every tree? Does everybody understand that? <laughs> that road to hell is a slippery one. Yeah, it's slippery. Isn't that right now? So when God told me to give a popcorn, guess what I didn't do? I didn't go out and find an alternative. I wasn't on Google, Googling an alternative to popcorn. What else gives me the same high that I used to get? <laughs> What else is it that makes me feel good? <laughs> Y'all understand it now. And you know, whenever we uh, hear a word from the Lord, whatever it may be for our lives now, I didn't put that off on anybody else. That was what he told me. But whenever we hear a word from the Lord like that, we ought to say, and, and this too, Lord. This too. This this smell like popcorn. I'm not going to even eat the the puffy chips that's supposed to mimic popcorn. And if I put butter on my grits and they get me to reminiscing about popcorn, I will eat no more grits. Y'all understand it now? Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? But we can be just like Eve. We can know something and still try to figure out, well, the popcorn ain't never killed me. I ain't never heard of popcorn killing anybody. Oh, but I guarantee you folks choke on it. How many of you ever choked on it? There you go. Yeah, popcorn don't have to have a death sentence, it, but it'll make you think you're leaving here. 
You get to talking and breathing and sucking it down your, <laughs> into your lungs. <laughs> yeah, and I was uh, uh, uh. Ooh, God, I almost left there. The, de- the devil almost got me. <laughs> That's a scary feeling, isn't it? I can't imagine what it's like to have asthma. I cannot imagine what that's like. You know, when a piece of popcorn get get, get in the wrong something, you see. You, you think your esophagus is this big. But it don't take much to think you're about to leave here. Does everybody understand that now? But to, just to think that, you see, and I'm telling you, God has a way. Uh, to let, our, uh, let us know that our life is not our own. I showed you that picture of my third grade teacher. Uh, she was taking a picture in January, and, and she was in the graveyard a few months later, that same year. In the picture that I have of her, she looked completely healthy, just like she looked a year before then when I was in her class. I had not known her to be sick. I didn't know anything about that. She was still a young woman. I think she was 33 when she passed away. Or 30. No, I think she was 30 when she passed away. And, you know, the way I knew she had died was I was in the fifth grade. And I, my, my teacher was, I saw my fifth grade teacher walking down the hall at the beginning of the fifth grade year. And she was just doing this, just crying. And, we, and somebody asked, what, what's wrong with Miss Singleton? And uh, it was because Mrs. Hamilton had died. And I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they might have been some kind of kin or something like that. And oftentimes, people think that um, they're going to get some kind of warning before death. That's not always the case. You know, you ask most people, 90% of the people, you ask them how, if you just had to choose how you were going to die, they would say, uh, and and, and choose, how how would you rather die? Most people would say, I would rather die in my sleep. Isn't that what most people say? I'd rather, but would you really? Let's think about that. How many of you, before you go to sleep, you kissing everybody and saying goodbye like you're about to leave here? Everybody see that now? Most people would think, I'd rather just die in my sleep. In other words, just as painless as possible and, you know, and things like that. I don't know, you know, if if we're just not thinking about it or what it is. But I think we need to live every day as if it's our last day. And not think that we're just going to just live for another hundred years. There are consequences for what we do. Does everybody understand it now? Is everybody there? The 13th chapter of the book of 1 Chronicles? We're going to start reading in verse 1. And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said, David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seemed good unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in the land of Israel, and with them also to the priests and Levites, which are in their cities and suburbs, and they, that they may gather themselves unto us. And let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. And all the congregation said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. So David gathered all Israel together from Shahar of Egypt, even unto the entering of Hamath, to bring the ark of God unto Kerjath Jerem. And David went up and all Israel to Bala, that is to Kerjath Jerem, which belonged to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God, the, the Lord, that dwelleth between the cherubims, whose name is called on it. And, it. and they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab and Uzzah and Ahoah. 
and drave the cart. And David and all Israel played before God with all their might. Everybody see that? And with singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and with cymbals and with trumpets. And when they came unto the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. Everybody see that? And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Therefore, at the place, that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? Everybody see that? Now, that's, that's the question he should have started with. That's that, he should have started with that. What was it? What is God's will concerning this? Y'all understand that now? What is God's will concerning this? And oftentimes that's what we do. We do what we want to do, and then we suffer for it, and then we get displeased with the Lord just like David was. We put all of our energy into it. Could you imagine now if there was ever a such thing as raining on a parade, this was it. Millions of people in this parade. Millions of others cheering it on. That was a big thing to them in their minds and their hearts to be bringing the presence of God right back into the camp of Israel because that's what the Ark of the Covenant represented, the presence of God. And for them to bring it back, that was a big deal to them. The question is, was it God's will? Yes, but how they did it was not. Now, we've gone over this story time and time again. In fact, if you go to verse, chapter 15, you'll read that they actually bring it back. back you know, they, uh, they, they figure out what they did wrong and they bring it on in. So what is it today that we're pointing out about this story? This story happened about a thousand years before Christ was born. What we read here today. This was about a thousand years before. The ark is coming down the road. Apparently, it, the, the, the oxen stumbled and the ark began to fall off of the cart. Now, of course, is that the way God intended for the ark to be carried? How was the ark supposed to be carried? On the shoulders of four men. On the shoulders of four men. And God had already said that only the priest can touch that ark. You had to be a, a son of Levi to do that. But they were carrying that ark the way that the heathens did. On a cart. Could you imagine? Do you see how they degraded the presence of God? We're going to put you on a cart and let the most stubborn animal in the world pull you. That's what we think about you. And they're going to be passing gas in front of you. Because oxen don't know any better. They just eat and pass gas. How many of you ever been to a parade when you were a child or whatever? Well, who's at the end of, uh, at, at the, end of the parade? The horses. Why are the horses at the end of the parade? <laughs> if you've really been to a parade, you know why. Because they, they leaving <laughs> little presents. We used to, when I was little, we used to go to them Christmas parades. It was always cold. And they dropping them little warm presents and and steam coming up off of them, and you just that wind blowing. And, ah, okay, it's over. It's over. We're clearing out. Okay, we get it. It's 
<laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know what they used to do at the club in California when I was stationed in California. And people didn't want to clear out of there. They having a good time dancing and they just they just pray uh uh what's that stuff called? Uh, pepper spray. Spray it up in the air. Whatever whatever dance you're doing, it's over. That's how they used to clear the club out. Y'all ain't got no sense. Three o'clock in the morning, you got to be to work at six. Get out of here. They spraying the stuff out of there. There was no regard for the holiness of God. Now, today we can look back on that and we can see that. But let's think about this. King David had never seen the Ark of the Covenant. Y'all understand that now? It hadn't been there since the days before Saul, but when Saul became king, there was no ark there. It was taken already. God had already made a breach and brought it into another land. Y'all understand it now? So King David knew nothing about it except that it existed and that the children of Israel should have it. So why are we talking about this story today? 500, about 500 years before then was Moses. And God gave that same Moses the directions on the Ark of the Covenant. Five, about 500 years before this happened, God gave direction on the Ark of the Covenant. How it's supposed to be made, who was supposed to bear it, how they're supposed to bear it. Y'all understand that now. And there it was, a man died for something that he didn't know anything about that took place 500 years ago. Y'all see that now? Somebody died for something that took place that he didn't know anything about 500 years ago. He didn't know anything about how to bring it in. In his heart and his mind, I'm just trying to save this holy thing from hitting the ground. But guess what God's heart and mind was about it? You should have knew my word. You should have knew my will about it. Only the priests are allowed to touch it. And even that's limited. Y'all understand that now? So... How do we bring this in, this lesson in for us today? What is it that God have told you to do that you're not doing? What is it that you're being disobedient in even today? And oftentimes we think, well, that, you know, the Lord told me to do something years ago and I am. So, so what? Yeah, so what? You're going you gonna to find out the what. There are always consequences Brothers and sisters, there are always consequences for disobeying God's word. Everybody understand that now? Let's read verse 12. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of the God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite, and the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord did what? Bless the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. Everybody see that? I think it's amazing that there was a blessing that came with the ark of the covenant. That's what David was trying to get a hold of. David wanted the blessing that came with the Ark of the Covenant. And I'm going to tell you something. It's not enough to want your hand on God. You better know how to put it there. Everybody Does everybody understand that now? You know people get married every day and don't know how to be married? People want that blessing and don't, don't know how to, to, to have it. Don't know how to carry it. I've seen men destroy their wives and destroy their, their, their families because they don't know how to be a husband. I've seen wives destroy their families because they don't know how to be wives. They, just, they, love, the, they love the companionship. 
they love the idea of saying that they're taken. But they're not concerned at all with being a husband or a wife. Don't know how to be and not asking for the wisdom, just winging it. That's what David was doing, winging it. He was just wing- Listen, and I, I hope you hear it today, brothers and sisters, especially we're talking about marriage now. Marriage is a covenant, just like this Ark of the Covenant. You better know what you're doing before you get into it. And if you don't halfway know what you're doing, you better have enough sense to ask for advice about it. You ain't got to ride it down the hill before you figure out it's there. Y'all understand that now? Those older people that came before us, they stayed married for the rest of their life because they knew how to be married. The first thing they understood was marriage is an unselfish institution. You can't be in it and be selfish at the same time. It's just, it's not going to last. Does everybody understand it now? There were no room for baby boys and daddy girls in marriage. No room for that. Y'all understand it now? And so it's important. We got a Bible to tell us how to be. Oh, uh, you could do it God's way. You could do it the way King David decided to do it. I'm gonna pull this marriage on it the same way the heathens do. I'm gonna do it the same way the heathens do. Y'all understand it now? So before we make any decisions in life, let's learn to think about the consequences of our decisions. People suffer behind our actions. Y'all understand that now? And I'm telling you, the devil loves it. Loves it when people refuse to think about life. If you're one of those individuals, you just live in life and you're just taking it as it comes, uh, the devil is the one feeding you your life. God intends for us to think about what we're doing and to think about the consequences of our actions. Does everybody understand now? I remember years ago, uh, my ex-wife and I, we would argue, and uh, I would say things like, um, uh, she would say, she might say, well, I'm, I'm going to leave, and I'd say, leave, go ahead, go. That was all the time. And then it happened. One day she left. All these things that we play out in our hearts, all these things that we've said with our mouth, there are consequences for those things. And I'm telling you, you are a bitter somebody when you produce your consequences and then you're mad at God for what you, for what you produced. When you say, let there be, and then you're mad at God because it be. How can God win with you? (laughs) You don't even live in reality in the real world when you've produced your own, when you produced your own consequences and then got the nerve to get mad at God about it. Y'all understand that now? The Bible tells us husbands to be not bitter against their wives. Isn't that what it say? Now, you know why that's, that's very, and I understand that whole thing. Be not bitter against your wife because, you know, she, may, she got some ways about her. 
you know, she she's her makeup is different than a man. So she got some ways about her. But, you know, I go beyond that. The Bible says, be not bitter against your wives. Isn't that what it say? So now here's what I think about it. Who is the Bible talking to when it says that? Now let's think about that, really. If she your wife, you made her your wife. How in the world you marry somebody and then get bitter against her? You are somebody. When you can make a woman your wife and then get mad at her. Whatever it is she doing, you ought to say, I married her. Whatever she doing. If you wake up one morning, she got a gun pointed at your forehead. <laughs> Just praise God, Lord, I asked for it. <laughs> I married it, Lord. I'm coming to see you. <laughs> This is just how you chose for me to go. And the Lord give it the Lord. <laughs> Y'all understand? Me personally, I think it's a shame that the, the Lord even had to say that. Husbands, be not bitter against your wives. I tell you, if it had been me, I'd have said, so Lord, can I ask some other stuff to that? Why did you marry her? Be careful who you marry. That's a big, that's the, y'all understand it now. Do you, this Bible, the Lord went out of his way for hardheads. Yeah, he did. He went out of his way for hardheads to tell husbands to be not bitter against your wife and you the one that married her. No, let me put it this, you chose her. You saw all the crazy signs before you got to the altar. She already put a gun in your forehead. Y'all understand it now? The Lord, that's the, that's the reason why there will be no excuses when we stand before God because he went above and beyond in his word to tell us common sense stuff. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Isn't it a shame that he's got to tell husbands to love their wives? Isn't that, so what was going on before you got married? Wives, submit yourself. Do, do I have to tell you? Okay, I guess I do. Y'all understand it now. The Lord in his word, went above and beyond to keep his people from going to hell. He's telling us stuff that we should just already be doing. If we took responsibility for ourselves. Y'all understand that now? Husbands, be not bitter against your wives. Isn't that a shame that he's got to tell husbands that? We ought not to look at that scripture and be thanking God that we found ourselves in it. We ought to be ashamed that if we are in that. Y'all understand that now? You know how that ought to read, baby boy. Your wife is not your mama. She's not going to coddle you, so please don't excuse her. That's, that's the way it really should read. I say that's the way it should read. Excuse your wife. You married her. You took and slept with her when she was 16. Sorry she didn't know how to cook everything you wanted her to know how to cook. Sorry she's not mature yet. <laughs> Sorry she's not fully developed in her brain yet. So please don't be bitter against her. Everybody see that now. If you wanted somebody like your mama, you should have married somebody your mama's age. <laughs> you marry somebody your age, you, they going to have to grow the same way you got to grow. Y'all understand that now. But this is what happens when we live in a society where we don't think there are no consequences. We don't think there are any consequences. 
We just expect everything the way we want it to be and there are no consequences. So then God goes out of his way with his word. Husbands, be not bitter against your wives. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. Does, do we really have to say that? Yeah, when we don't, we, we don't, we think we can eat of that tree and there not be any consequences. When we just live life and just whatever happens, happens. Before we close, I want us to all think about this. What is it in your life where you pivoted? Everybody should have that thought to think about. What is it that you wish you had done different where you could have pivoted? Does everybody understand that now? You know, I tell you, that's a loaded question, isn't it? If we, if we go back and ask grandma and grandpa and mom and daddy what they wish they had pivoted at, we would, and if they could go back, some of us wouldn't be in here. <laughs> They'd pivot us right out of existence. <laughs> <laughs> y'all understand that now so let's learn to think about life that way it, it's not just them that made decisions to get us here or made decisions for our lives to be the way that they were we are making those decisions today. The kind of children that we're raising, we're, we're making the decision. Does everybody understand it now? So brothers and sisters, let's learn to think about our lives. Let's learn to think about what it is that we're doing and, and think about what we have done. Y'all understand that now? Because if we live our life not thinking about consequences of our actions, whether they're good or bad, then we're prone to keep making foolish decisions. If we don't think about the decisions that we're making today, and we're just just going through life and just thinking we're just, listen, and I want to make this clear. A lot of the things that we're experiencing is a result of a decision that we made yesterday. And if we don't learn, if we don't learn to think about our decisions and the, the things, the decisions that we've made, the mistakes that we've made and what we could do to change those things and what we can do to be better, we're going to continue to make bad decisions. Y'all understand that now? If I'm married, and I know I don't like arguing, I know, how many of you know what I'm talking about, the, the atmosphere in your home after you and your spouse done got into it or whatever the case is? S so how many of you kn know what I'm talking about when I say that now? How many of you like the presence of the devil in your house that you feel when, when, when that's the case? That separation there that you feel, how many of you like it? The, the question is, so what are you doing about it? Does it make any sense to not like the summation of what what's of what you the decision that you made, but still I'm gonna still make the decision? Does that make any sense? So that means we gotta do something different then. That's what life is about. Do you know if we took this Bible and we got rid of every Bible? and we stopped talking about God. The whole world stopped talking about God. Nobody knows anything about God. Do you know if a man just sit and he just thinks, he looks at the sun, he looks at creation, do you know he'll still be able to come up with that God exists somewhere? That's what the book of Romans says. Nature is your Bible. 
a man can look at nature and look at how, look at how things are formed and tell it's, it's something higher that made this and it wasn't us. You can take all the Bible, you can take all, of, you can take God out of, a voca- out of people's vocabulary. Somebody somewhere is going to worship God because they're going to know just through observance that God exists. Isn't that right now? That means that God intends for us to think. He intends for us to observe. Does everybody understand it now? I, I hope that we get it, brothers and sisters. Your, what you see in your life is the result of, of, of decisions that you've made. What you see in your life is the result of decisions that you made. Does everybody understand it now? Ain't no use in getting mad about it. Because that's all, you know that's all bitterness is. Bitterness comes upon people that have not accepted their, the responsibility of, of their actions. That's what bitterness is. If you bitter, it's because you have not accepted responsibilities for your own actions. That's, that's what bitterness is. Could you imagine Adam and Eve eating of that tree and then they seeing their offspring die off and they seeing the results of it and then they getting bitter against God about it? Bitterness is the result of people not accepting the consequences of their actions, not accepting responsibility. Y'all understand now? I'm telling you, it's, t- it's time for us to grow up and get out of this victim mentality. You dated a man that broke your heart. You dated the man that broke your heart. Does everybody understand that? You didn't send somebody else out on a date. You went. But today we get so, we're so crazy in our brain with, them, with this victimhood. Y'all understand? So you could say, well, I didn't know that they were like that. Well, and then you didn't take the chance to get to know them either. Still your fault. Did you ask anybody around town how they are as a boyfriend? But we just, we just got to play the victim in everything. We choose people then get mad at how they, how they treat us. Y'all understand that now. And so then what chance does God have when he's telling us to pay attention to life? Pay attention to life. Pay attention because there are consequences for every decision that you make. If you just think about that, every decision that you make, there are consequences for it. Y'all understand now. If you want to mature in God, you're going to have to learn to take responsibility and own up and accept your consequences. Before we close, these people in the 13th chapter of the book of 1 Chronicles, they made a big parade out of this. And that's what we do. I want us to think about that. Life in general is a parade for us. Our whole life is on display for the world to see. 
And just like this parade here, they got all the harps and all the psalteries and all the trumpets, and they just, they just playing with their whole might and singing with their whole might. Only for God to come and reign on that parade. Because they did not inquire of him how to do it. And, as, and in other words, and so the Bible says that David was displeased with the Lord, was displeased. And oftentimes that's where people are, even in God. They're disappointed, they're displeased because things didn't go their way. And they think that it was supposed to go their way because they made a big, they made a big parade about it. They celebrate it. They may even know something is God's will, and they just, they just got it all on display. And they're not thinking, wait a minute, but what does God say about this? Let's go find this in the Bible. Everybody understand it now? And a man died because... They did not know the Bible, how to do it. I, I sincerely believe had David, David remembered how it was supposed to be done, he'd have done it the right way. But you see just about what God thinks about ignorance. A man died because of ignorance. Everybody understand that now? Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, if we don't know anything about God, we better know this. He's got a way to do things, and he don't back off of it. No, no, he don't back up off of it. Everybody understand that now. I think it's very interesting that the Ark of the Covenant went to this man's house, the family of Obed-Edom, and it was there for three months, and the Bible says that God blessed that household. Now, do you know God didn't have to bless that household? What was God doing? What example was God showing us today? You know, and I, I just say this, and I, I hope I make it clear. People can look at other people's marriages. They may look at my wife and our marriage, and they may see how happy we are with each other. The other day we celebrated 14 years of marriage. And they may see, you know, that we, my wife and I, we haven't argued in over a decade now. No disagreements, anything like that. Y'all understand that now? And they may wonder how, you know, and they may see that, and they may see how my wife and I are blessed. And, and they may wonder, so why is it that that's the case and it's not the case for me? Why am I still in turmoil? Why am I still struggling? So you heard me say that my wife and I, we haven't argued in over a decade, right? You want me to tell you why? Just very simple. Because we follow the Bible. We follow the Bible. Very simple. It's really just this simple. Y'all understand that? I, let me just put it this way. What is, what is the key to my wife and I not arguing? Because I don't know how you can argue in a marriage and still be happy in a marriage. You know, like, I don't know how that happens. What is the key to my wife and I not being happy in our marriage and not arguing in over a decade? Because we follow the Bible. I, first of all, I love her as Christ loved his church. And I love her to the point, just like Christ loved his church. And I don't mean in a coddling way because the Lord don't coddle his church. I love her enough to tell her the truth. I love her enough to be her head. Y'all understand that now? And my wife, she does what the Bible says. She will submit herself to her own husband as unto the Lord. Does everybody understand that now? Do we know how deep that go? If my wife is submitted to me as unto the Lord, how is she going to ever argue with me? We're not going to have one disagreement. 
Does everybody understand it now? I'm so glad that my kneecap don't have its own brain. This body that you're looking at has got one brain. It's got one head. And it follows. The rest of my body follows whatever this head say to do. Y'all understand it now? I, my body only got one head, just like your body only got one head. Uh, y'all hear me now? So if, if my body only have one head, there, there's no room in this body for opinions. There are no second suggestions. This head says what it, what it wants the rest of the body to do. And, and the rest of the body line up. Does everybody understand that? Every movement. So y'all see what I'm doing now? Y'all know what told it to do that? My brain. Whatever I do with my body, my brain is telling my body to do that. There are no arguments there. Y'all see... Uh, Ever seen somebody with Parkinson's disease? And y'all see how they get so they shake and then they, they have to hold themselves to keep from shaking? How many of you seen that? That's what marriages look like when it's got two heads. The head wanted to do something, but the body is not obeying. So now the head's got to tell this hand to hold this disobedient part of the body down. That's Parkinson's is what a, ba a marriage with two heads look like. This here is opinionated. It's got its own ideas. I had a life before you came along. I was independent before you came along. And so this knows, yeah, but I'm supposed to be running you. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to be the head. I'm supposed to be making the decision. But this refuses to give up. So now this has to send this to hold it back, and this is complaining. See, you're holding me down. Everybody see? That? This is what it looks like, and this comes to church. Look, when I see you married couples, I see one body, and this is what some of y'all look like. Raising your hands to the Lord and everything, but you look like this. Everybody see? That's all Parkinson's is. It's a two-headed body. A brain with a will and a body with its own will that's going to fight against the brain. Everybody see that now? And this won't the blessings of God. This won't answer prayers. Does everybody understand that now? This knows it's supposed to be running it, but this doesn't. It's just, I'm going to just keep going. Does everybody see now, what would happen if I came out doing this one day and I didn't announce to y'all what was going on? I just came out just shaking like this. Wouldn't you pray for me? Wouldn't you say, would you say something was wrong? Yeah, so something is wrong. <laughs> I say the same thing. Something is wrong. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit, just, uh, submit yourselves unto your own husbands so you don't look like you got Parkinson's. Everybody see now? So everybody want a happy marriage. Everybody want a good marriage. Don't want to argue for the rest of their life. But everybody ain't willing, but we going to keep. But I got an opinion. I still, what about me and how I feel? Does everybody see that? This is what it looks like. Just like this. Everybody understand that now? We'll go right home and still let the devil have his way. Does anybody see that now? Now, how many of you knew before you got married as wives you were supposed to submit to your husband? Before you got married, you understood, I'm supposed to submit, I'm supposed to do what you say. You know, you know the man is supposed to run it, don't you? So if you know it, then why not? Why are you not obeying it? Y'all understand now? Do you know I have to ask my wife what she think about stuff? She don't just volunteer and tell me. I have to ask her. And even then, I got to pull it out of her. So what do you really think? 
No, I'm asking, I want you, I got to do that. She's not bulldozing me with old people. I can care less about the bulldozing. Does everybody understand that now? I have to pull that out of her. Sweetheart, what do you think about this? That stuff is not stuff she's volunteering. Y'all understand that now? <laughs> this ain't supposed to have an opinion. There's no brain in there. Y'all understand? Now I'm trying to show you, you get out of that victim's mentality. When you marry a man, you accept everything he's got to say for the rest of your life. Ain't no use in getting mad about it. That's what you married. If, even if you don't like it, you married it, go along with it. Y'all understand now? That, so we understand that this is supposed to be plain and clear before marriage. The, listen, think of it this way. When I married my wife, I married her with the idea of wherever she is today, if I got to live with that for the rest of my life, that I'm willing to live with it. If she don't ever grow, I accept her where she is right now. But people don't get married for like that anymore. I, I, I see potential in you. Right now, you're this way, but you wait. When I get done sending up my timber to the Lord, <laughs> and it ain't just men, and women too. I'm going to pray that the Lord will make you the husband you're supposed to be. <laughs> Y'all understand now? To me, when you marry a person, you're supposed to be in your mind. If you grow, that's good. If not, that's good. To I accept you where you are. Somewhere along the lines, we forget about that. We get bitter. We get mad. And then, and then what happens is our love turns into selfishness. Now I got to fight for myself. You understand now? You're supposed to give that up. The way of this world is for folks to get married and then keep their own identity. That's not, that's not the way of God. Does everybody understand it now? So you, you sisters, when you marry a man, that's what you're telling that man. I have no more opinion. Whatever you, whatever, I, I'll tell you if you ask me, I have a thought about things, but I, you know, I'm, whatever decisions you make, I trust you. That's what you're saying. Does everybody understand that now? Other than that, it's a breach of contract. Y'all understand now? How many of you ever got hired at a company and decided you were going to change it? Does everybody understand? You got hired at McDonald's flipping burgers, but you want to make executive decisions. <laughs> you better stay in that brawler room. Y'all understand that now? I'll tell you. It's, it's amazing to me, and I say this in close, it's amazing to me the number of people that's bitter in their marriage although they chose to be in their marriage. It, how, what can God do for you when you're bitter about your own decisions? When you're mad about decisions that you've made? How can God, what, how can you learn a lesson from God at all when you're mad at the, at, at the consequences of your own actions, of your actions? How are you bitter against a woman that you chose? How are you not submissive uh, to a husband that you allowed yourself to be chosen by? There's something wrong when believers don't even accept the consequences of their own actions. How are we going to learn? We're not even paying attention 
if we the first if we're not first paying attention to our own actions and the consequences of it. We're still living the devil's Bible. Do what you will. There are no consequences. You can you can disobey God and there not be consequences for it. We're still in in the in the third chapter of the book of Genesis. Still doing what we want to do and there are no consequences. Y'all understand now. I, I say this. Whatever you're going through, you take your whipping like a man or like a woman. Whatever you're going through. You don't get bitter against your wife. You don't get bitter against your husband. You married him. You deal with it. Y'all understand that now. And if I know God, ain't nothing changing until you change. No, ain't nothing changing until you change. <laughs> Does everybody understand that now? Ain't no use in Ahab asking God to remove Jezebel until he stopped being Ahab. Y'all understand? Yeah, Ahab need to put his foot down and Jezebel will get saved. Yes, she will. She got some kind of religion. She understands some of it. Y'all understand that now? And so, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, it's catch 22. <laughs> there would not have been a Jezebel if there was not an Ahab. She couldn't have been married to nobody but Ahab. Y'all understand that now? Hmm. Let's go to the book of First Kings real briefly. Let's go to the 21st chapter. We're going to read verse, start reading verse 17, just real briefly. Said, and the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to me, Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whether he is gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus said the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus said the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Has thou found me, O my, mine enemy? Everybody see that? Everybody see that now? Was Elijah Ahab's enemy? No, oh, Ahab was his own enemy. But he wanted to put the blame on what was the word that was coming to him on somebody else. Everybody see that now? Look what it says. And he answered, I have found thee because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Everybody see that now? So you see what Elijah's telling him. What I'm about to say is your fault, not my fault. Don't say I'm your enemy for telling you what I'm about to tell you. Verse 21, behold, I will bring evil upon thee and will take away thy posterity and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nebat and like the house of, of Basha the son of Ahijah 
for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab, of Ahab in the city of the, the dog shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. Everybody see that? Now look at this very carefully. Verse 25. But there was none like unto Ahab. <coughs> which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. Everybody see that? Listen. Whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. Everybody see that? Who stirred him up? Now, I want to say this before we close. Oftentimes, Jezebel gets the bad rap in this scripture. But let's read that again. But there was none like unto who? There was none like unto who? Not there was none like unto Jezebel. There was none like unto who? Ahab. What did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom what? His wife did what? Let me explain what that scripture means before we close. Today is Mother's Day, isn't it? I can't explain to you how important it is for men to accept fatherhood. We thank our mothers for weaning us. The prophet Samuel, who raised him? Eli. When did Eli start raising him? after he was weaned off of his mother's breast. At what age are children supposed to be weaned off their mother's breast? When they get teeth. When they get teeth, that is God's sign that they need to start chewing on some food. If they suck in that breast after they get teeth, mama's got a problem. Does everybody understand that now? And some others experience the bite. Because they want to bite something. Y'all understand that now? When them babies get teeth, it's, that's, it's time to give them some food to chew on. And Ahab is our first example of a baby boy. When young men take to their mother's raising. Now, I want to explain what this means when it says, whom Jezebel stirred up. That means that Ahab was just as emotional as his wife was. And he could be easily moved and swayed by his wife. A man that's raised by a man ain't going to be easily moved by his wife. Woman, I don't care what you say. We're doing this. I feel led to, we're going to do this. So it's dangerous for a man to still be in a place where he can be stirred. If my wife act a fool, I know how to sit still. I saw my mother one time get smart with my father. I was sitting in the living room. My daddy made a statement that my mother didn't like. And my mother said, well, Hawk, I ain't scared of you. You know, my, my daddy didn't start 
go outside and pick the car up and show her how strong he was? My daddy did exactly what y'all just did. He laughed. <laughs> and my mama got on up and said what, and did what my daddy told her to do. You ain't got to be scared of me. <laughs> That's not why I'm giving this order. <laughs> y'all understand that now. Real men aren't stirred up. They're not moved. It's, it's dangerous. I expect women to be emotional and moved out by and tossed to and fro, like you know, because that's their makeup. They follow wherever the wind goes. If they're not in God, but God have given men something extra, have given men a logic to go by, and that's how we're supposed to live by a logic. We're not supposed to be stirred up emotionally. We're not supposed to be worked up because the devil done got into her for a minute. Y'all understand that now? A man's feet is supposed to be planted. One of the reasons why my wife is so stable emotionally is because when, in the times when she was acting a plum fool and all over the place, I stayed in the same place and gave her somewhere to come back to. But if I was stirred up and I was all emotional and, and she's over there acting a fool and then I'm over there acting a fool, we, she don't know where to come back to. Ahab is just as emotional as his wife. That's the reason why he was falling into sin. That's the reason why that household was all in an uproar. That, listen, and I want to make this clear, Ahab had daughters. But the judgment was pronounced on him that pisseth against the wall. Why? Because we don't need any more emotionalisms sitting on the throne. We're going to kill every man, child of yours. It was the men that were killed in that household from top to bottom. Oh, some of the daughters got it. But all of the men were killed. All of Ahab's sons were killed. That's what God thought about the emotionalism. We don't need no more emotionalism here on the throne. We don't need another man that the wife can stir up. Does everybody understand that now? I told y'all about that time when my wife and I, we first got married, and we were having church in the, in the sanctuary at the house, and I don't know what it was she was upset by, but she got to flipping chairs over. Disappointed, I guess. And I went on in the room, and at some point she, she came in there and got herself together and apologized. And I said, yeah, and uh, yeah, those chairs, they need to be uh, put back. <laughs> the same devil that <laughs> had you flipping chairs, you call them back and tell them, put them back like we had them. <laughs> Y'all understand that now. That's the strength of a family. The man, if the man is all over the place, if he emotional, it's, it's going to be turmoil. Does everybody understand that now? It don't need two females in there. No, it don't either. Y'all understand that now? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today. God, we ask that you will help these things to be in our hearts. Help us, Lord, to really live these things that we've heard today and to find ourselves, Lord, in the word that you've spoken. God, we thank you for the healing that have taken place today. Not only, Lord, with our natural bodies, but also with our hearts and our minds. Forgive us, Lord, for the things that we've come up short in. Help us, Lord, to just live completely like you've spoken to us to live, Lord. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for dying on the cross for us. Lord, we thank you for helping us all to recover from the things that the enemy have sent our way. Help us, Lord, be, to be sober-minded and to be watchful. Lord, we pray also that you will continue to lead us and guide us in our everyday lives 
so that we can bring glory to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, we thank you all for being here today. My prayer is that something was said that have helped you. All right. The Lord say the same. We'll meet up later and uh, discuss the things that we've heard. All right. If that's all now, we'll go and dismiss you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.